And we are live. Doc, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Well, nice I'm doing to see you good. again. Likewise. Nice to see you again. Thank you for joining me again uh, today. I'm not pressed for time, so we can uh, go as long as you're available and, and really get into uh, some of the topics. And I've already gotten some great feedback from people uh, on our previous conversation that we've had. And if you're watching this now, and you haven't seen the previous conversation with Dr. Ravi and I, then definitely go check that out. And while I, while, um, do you want to make a quick introduction, tell people who you are, and then I'm going to share this, and then you can uh, find it on my wall and share it as well. And if you're okay. watching this, um, go ahead and share it. If uh, and even after the fact, if you're watching this after we're streaming live, hit that share button. It's a lot of great information that's uh, going to be um, uncovered here. And go ahead, Doc. Hi, Bill. It's a pleasure to be back again. I, I didn't expect uh, such an enthusiastic response to the last talk. <laughs> I, I thought we went a little long, but uh, that's okay. Uh, you, you managed to get me started on some topics that I'm passionate about. So it just kind of flowed from there. Uh, The one of the feedbacks I got after that particular conversation was uh, this whole question of training behavior where you teach a dog something, but then the dog that is that the end of it, or when does the behavior become what I call competition worthy behavior? And that is a whole different can of worms that uh, most people just gloss over or don't touch. It takes a long time to understand what uh, really makes a behavior a competition worthy behavior. How do you get there from just teaching something to a dog? Well, and I think it's, I think it's important to talk about why we have competitions and um, the standards that that people must adhere to. It's a universal standard. Um, what are what are the benefits of competition, in your opinion? Um, the all competition is built upon ego. So, if there were no two people trying to demonstrate that one is superior to the other, there would be no competition. So. As long as people understand that you, the foundation of competition is ego, wow. then you have the basis of actually doing competition where it does not serve just one person's trip, but is actually has some redeeming value beyond just the point of proving a point to one person or to a crowd. So, so I always try to get that clear uh, because all competition is fundamentally ego. The dog, my dog has only a few concerns about its life. It likes to get, it likes to be able to sleep. It likes to be able to eat. It likes to chase a squirrel if it can. And if it gets an opportunity with a willing female, it likes to mount it. But apart from that, it, it does not get up in the morning saying that it's going to be a Schutzen champ. <laughs> uh, it, it, it does not have any such plan or idea. And even when it is a champion, it has no clue that it is a champion. So, so that is something that people need to understand about competition. But having said that, there is value for competition because competition allows people to refine methodology, refine technique, and evolve and gain an understanding as to the reason why things happen the way they do. Absolutely. And therefore, if you approach competition from... Uh, a methodology proofing process, then competition has a redeeming value that out. 
Uh oh. You froze, Doc. Hold on one second. I think Who I we know. Not? Hold on one second. Let me let me hook up my Ethernet. I forgot that you hook up the Ethernet. Okay. Should have a better connection here in just a second. All right. All right. Sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. And I think we're good. I'm going to make sure that we're dedicated to the Ethernet um, uh, cable here. Done. Okay. All right. Sorry so about that. I, as long as we understand that. If we understand that the purpose of competition is to refine methodology, if the purpose of competition is to establish uh, the process of trading, then we have a value for competition that exceeds just the ego-driven idea of proving who's best. Uh, There's a bigger purpose here. Yeah. You know, like and I think, I think that is important for a lot of people who approach competition. They never get beyond the point of proving what is best. But a few top level people at some point in their life, they all get to the point of understanding competition as uh, a, a methodology proofing ground. And uh, and because they have to approach the competition field with different partners, even though you know Wallace Spain may compete with one dog this year, and then five years down the road he has a new dog, so each partner that he gets on the field is a different set of variables, where there are common themes, but there are also individualistic variations with that particular dog that he's having that he has to approach the methodology of training for a competition differently so well, it becomes super nuanced then too it becomes yes. super nuanced and then fine point and polishing and and you really really need to know what you're looking for and how to fix some of these problems that might pop up so right. here this is where uh, the you start seeing differences you'll see uh, certain certain dog trainers they will tend to always pick a particular type of dog to compete with. Uh, and the reason they do that is because that particular dog fits their methodology. And that their methodology is not just how they teach a sit down or stand, but their methodology is their entire personality. Mm how they eat, sit, walk, how they, how they respond to stress, the, how the handler uh, uh, reacts to pressure. All of that determines the choice of the partner he chooses to compete with. Absolutely. And, and top trainers understand the dog very well, and they also understand who they are themselves very well. And they understand that this dog, and they have come to this conclusion over years. They never, they were never born with it. They, they arrived at this understanding of who they are as a person and who the dog, the kind of dogs they are likely to best succeed with. And they choose those kind of dogs. And this is one of the reasons why uh, people who get into the sport, almost never pick a dog to suit their personality. They pick a dog because they like the way the dog looks or something of that sort. Mm. Or, that, or because that was the dog available to them in their town. You know, they had a breeder and they picked it. And they... They, they don't know they, what they don't know. They, right. Yeah, exactly. They don't know what they don't know. And they take the first dog and they struggle with it. They go to a club. They're, you know, if they're lucky, the club uh, training director or the coach there says that, okay, you have a decent dog. Maybe we can do something with it. And then they do something with it. And then they stumble, they fall, and they lose heart. And some of them quit. Some of them continue. But 
it is this uh, because their approach is more based on personal likes and dislikes rather than fitness for a particular task therefore they never make the switch from training a behavior to training for competition because they are they have already hamstrung themselves with the inappropriate tools for the job absolutely well and sometimes um you know they they also i don't know they get jaded you know they get they go down the wrong path they learn they re- learn i mean like you said it starts out fundamentally wrong right and and like you said i love how you started out with ego man you're speaking my language right no, and it, if, is, if, it is it is ego i mean like I, you know schutzen initially was a breed survey test uh, designed by the founder of the breed max von that's Stephens. right and no one really competed until a few uh, dog owners in the area where max was there started uh, you know having their saturday sunday night beer fest and they would they would just compete and say okay my dog does my dog heal better than your dog you know and that's how the whole thing started all right yeah. and if you look back there are videos of 1936 uh, dog handlers um you know doing shoots and it was very rudimentary they were just walking along with their dog and the dogs were moving around and things like that but as things went on it started becoming more and more refined and um oh yeah okay yeah i got i just had a history of shoots i just clicked on the first one just to see you know there's yeah. uh from the 1890s it looks like it started back and um yeah you know almost 100 in uh what 30 years now yeah yeah 1896 i believe was the first shepherd uh, no so now so anyway coming back to uh, so you have a population of a uh, dog enthusiasts who who enter the competition field well and this is the same whether you go to agility or whether you go to dog diving or whether you go to shoot right it's specialized well i assume that it's, is it in aspects the same in the medical field as well with specializations and you know it's no in the in the medical field people don't get into medical college because there's an extensive vetting process so you you are not allowed to just walk in uh, to the medical school so the vetting process eliminates people could you imagine if you were could you imagine what it would look like like if if yeah yeah it it, it would be pretty uh pretty so, dangerous did you oh by the way did you share this i shared it on my personal page i haven't yet what I, how do i do yeah that? so uh either go to my bow wow bill page or yeah. go uh or go to my personal page and then share it and while you're doing uh, that you guys yeah i got it i got it i wanted to shout out muffy Waldman, who sent me these books. She loves these uh, live streams that we're doing. Muffy is awesome. Yeah, she's rad. And she makes these little leashes. And so, um, you know, thank you very much, Muffy. I I appreciate these. And if you want to send me any books or anything, go ahead. (laughs) I love it. Bring it on. Um, So I just want to make sure that you share it, Doc, because you have an audience that loves you and, and... I want to make sure that they're joining us as well. Um, so just I want to take a second to to mention that. Yes. And then also I wanted to mention our pa- my Patreon page. And I'm starting to get a bunch of Patreon subscribers. And as an added benefit, if you subscribe at the $20 level, I'm going to be doing a two-hour interactive Zoom session uh, with an expert every single month. And so it, it's going to be a little bit different than a live stream where you can actually step up, ask questions uh, about your particular situation and uh, should be a lot of fun. So I'll put a link to my Patreon down below. And were you able to share everything, Doc? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So you were saying that the medical school is is vetted. Um, and you know what? Some of these, the best dog training programs are vetted. And yeah. they, they drop these dogs oh. as soon as they sh- the dog shows uh, so, a, a weakness. Oh, go ahead. Top clubs. Uh, top highly competitive clubs uh, do their own vetting process. Uh, they are not as stringent as getting into medical school, but they do have a vetting process, and uh, they 
there are top clubs will not accept everyone who just wants to come in and say, okay, I want to train. Uh, they have to be, uh, they need to have the right tools. So, so that brings the first thing is uh, um, when you want to do training for sport is different than training a behavior. And I'll, I, I, you know, in 2016, I did an interview on Debbie Zappia. I wrote an article after she had won the world championship. And she began her interview with me with, with one, one sentence, and it, it captured the uh, entire gamut of training in that uh, one or two sentences. And the, the, she, her phrase was, the training of, of my competition dog is not the same as training of dogs. Okay. And and I and this, and then she went on to make the statement and nobody you you can spend a lifetime uh, dissecting this statement she made it says I control all the resources mm. of my dog in my training program. And in that one phrase, in that one statement, she basically unpackaged her entire training program in that, in that statement, which means her dog does not get to eat, sleep, drink, poop, pee, nothing without her control of it. Most people don't live with their dogs like that. Most and people, as you were saying in the last interview we did the the investment of love versus the return that we receive right yeah yes is is, is so disproportionate and that's what makes the relationship with the the, the dog so uh, attractive to people right but that to me and i know because i've been i've been to gold school i've been to these working clubs i've seen the best of the best and literally i've seen them and i've done it myself count the licks that a dog will take a drink of water of 27 licks boom catalog every how many pieces of kibble that dog receives how much they weigh every gram of food that this dog receives they catalog it all and and that to me it, it kind of ups the the investment of of your behavior right to 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 have a sport dog i love what you said man the training of my competition dog is not the same as training dogs and people yes. need to understand that so that then now a, a casual person who listens to the statement makes the erroneous leap to judgment that these trainers are being cruel they are not being cruel Absolutely. ever never they are one of the most compassionate most understanding uh, handlers of dogs and i have never seen a a top trainer be cruel to his dog. I've not seen it. I've never seen it. So that's one thing. And let me explain to you what. Even if they come down on on their dog with a two by four, they don't. But they, if they, if necessary, yeah. they do it to save the dog's life. So yes. they're not being cruel. So the second thing is, let me explain to you what cruelty looks like. I want to explain. Um, and I'm going to talk about purely positive as an example of cruelty. Okay. People don't understand what cruelty is. And they talk about purely positive as being gentle. And so. In purely positive, you have only two methods of training. And that is, you either give a reward or you take away the enjoyment of a reward. That's the only yeah, two positive, ways. Positive reinforcement and negative punishment. Yeah. You do not have any other option except these two. Now, let us say that your reward is play or food, which are the two existential rewards that you people give. So if you have to deny or correct a dog only by removal of something, 
then let's say the dog misbehaved in the yard immediately you put the dog up into a kennel right so what did the dog lose the dog lost its freedom to play and let's say the dog does not understand what correct behavior is then the only way you can make that loss of freedom meaningful is to completely have the dog in a caged existence for the rest of its life except for that one hour of prison yard time that you allow it right mm-hmm. otherwise if the dog could go and play whenever it wants if you pull it out of the of uh, out of the uh, play uh, play yard because it be misbehaved it'll go and play somewhere else and so the effect the the negative effect of your withdrawal of that is of no value well Which and sometimes is, they'll, they'll they'll learn to play within their confinement exactly so so that means the dog literally has no life except mm. for what you choose to give it in my lexicon in my definition that is cruelty my dogs are allowed to play whenever they i don't deny them their food i don't deny them their play but i correct them when they experience a negative when it is a negative they don't experience a negative by loss necessarily of something joyful right right so so that is something they experience about. consequence they experience they, a consequence they experience consequence so coming back to training for for competition wallace pain gave made me a statement a long time ago and I, i i took a long time thinking about it he said that the dog must want must have no option other than to want to do the job or do the behavior other See, than to want to do the behavior the that so there are there are two parts to that sentence one is the dog must have no option other than and the second part of that sentence is that to want to do it and this is the difference between competition behavior and regular training behavior competition dogs execute behaviors as if their existence depends upon it the, the trainer makes the behavior existential have you ever heard of installing the must key yes what does you that mean must, to you the dog needs to understand that you must do it because i say so at this point and then i go one step further i then teach the dog to love the must key the must key so that's three words and i had i was like what are they saying when i first heard that term i was like the must key well, the ba- so, so, bot bot likes to use the word must key yeah yeah that's what that's who i learned it from my mentor and and uh, amazing uh coach and, and amazing yeah the must the must key right where the dog thinks that hey george george is here george cockrell one of the ogs do you know george he's over kind of by you isn't he uh george has uh, been training I, dogs longer than i've been alive doc so he's a, a great lot of guy. people are there who train dogs yeah and then um i want to go back to the ego really quick because i want to say this i think it's important right because a lot of times people are like kill the ego like the ego is no good and i'm just like no man the ego is absolutely the definition of who we are as individuals right and uh i say without an ego there would be nothing stopping me like if i was sitting at the table with you doc and we were having dinner together there'd be nothing stopping me from taking the food on my f- spoon and putting it in your mouth because we would have that no separation right you know when when somebody comes and tells me kill the ego man i immediately walk away because <laughs> that person is probably the most egotistical person out there oh, wow every everyone That's everyone who, yeah. everyone who who says you know i come to the sport with no ego 
Oh boy, they they are, they are blown up like a balloon. Over. I love that but, you but, started with that, though. That's what just what the, I'm saying. See, I I love to be very good at what I do. I want to be very good at what I do, and I don't want to move and sit and eat and play with people who are not very good at what they do. Mm. I want to sit and move and eat and play with people who are also very good at what they do. So that those are the they, those are the tuna. Yeah. The tuna you're fishing they, for, right? They are the people who I look up to and who inspire me and who challenge me. I think to, this is what people does exactly. not think that people think that ego means arrogance. And do you know what? Don't get me wrong, like there is a type of arrogance too that I think, I mean, because this is an evolution and I mean, not as, as like, as, as being, um, you know, victimizing people or, or whatever, but just knowing that, you know, the right answer, knowing that, you know, the truth and walking in that truth with a, a sort of pride that other people might construe as arrogance, but ego is not arrogance at all. Ego is that separation. There is a subtle difference between ego and arrogance. Arrogance is um, ego that you use the, the features of ego to, to diminish somebody else. If you can uh, or can't back it up. If, is, it, is it arrogance if you can back it up or is it arrogance if you can't back it up? It would be ignorance if you can't back it up, I guess. I don't know. I, but, it, 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 it is not arrogance if you can back it up. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, John McEnroe in tennis uh, is cocky, but he backs it up. Right. Uh, uh, so so did uh, Michael so did, Jordan. Uh, Michael Jordan and uh, so right. did uh, who's that guy? The Mamba mentality. Who's that guy? Um, Ruth, Ruth, uh, uh, Babe no, Ruth, um, Reggie Jackson, um, Dennis no, Rodman. I don't know, no. all of them, all of the top athletes. They back all, it up. that's right. Um, who, they, who just passed away? Uh, Kobe yeah. Bryant, right? Yeah, yeah, he, he, backed, God bless him. He backed it, he backed it up. Yeah. So, but but the thing is, confidence. Well, I, I mean, you might consider it. So he said that he prefers to consider it confidence, but you, what you consider, what you, what you consider it as somebody else might consider. I don't know. It's, I guess, all in the interpretation. The, the best of the best, they don't compete with other people. They compete with themselves. Oof, I love that. They, they, uh, and uh, in my field as a physician, I'm, I'm very good at what I do. And uh, I, I don't fear competition because excellence really cannot compete. The excellence has no competition, Excel, because excellence does not compete with anything outside of itself. It strives to be and to be the best yeah. it can so, be, right? See, Wallace Penn does not compete with anyone except himself. Uh, Mike Deal does not compete with anyone except himself. These people who are right at the top of the game, they compete with themselves at all times. They they are they are the top of what they do, and they compete with themselves. And they teach their dogs to be like themselves. They they teach the dog to to compete, to find joy in the must, to find their joy in the existential. They make the behavior the reason for the dog's existence, mm. but they don't. They do it in a way that instills joy see you can you can you can browbeat a dog into doing something and you will have a dog that will perform like a donkey all right it'll, and you it'll, know it you it'll know it sling, it's it'll slink its way through the performance hang dog look oh shit i, I had to we call it flat a flattened dog we call yeah, it flat, flat flattened no but but these two people who are the, at the top of the game they First, they select dogs that thrive under the competition pressure, and then they raise that dog's ability to the next level. They are like the Navy SEALs. It's, it's like they select, they select warriors. 
and they will not play with people who are not warriors they will not play with dogs who are not warriors so this is where you change from just being a, a newbie coming in with a dog that you just happen to pick because you like its color or its fluffy fur <laughs> a looking at dog i call it a looking at dog just like sometimes you go into a house and there's looking at towels. You don't use those towels. <laughs> you just yeah. look at them, right? You don't consider what the dog was bred for. You're just looking at their outside features or you're not considering yeah. that person or that individual animal's temperament. Yeah. You're just looking at them being like, oh, that, that dog is cute. That dog would look good with my lifestyle. I'm going to bring him home with me. So right. the, so this is where we see the evolution of a, of a competition dog. So that's yeah. bought with uh, Thor. Thor. Look Amazing. at the tail. Look Amazing. at the ears up. This is this is the opposite of flat, ladies and gentlemen. This is a dog whose existence yeah. is so cool to watch. If you guys haven't watched this, Bart Bell and Tor, uh, watch it. Is it's yeah, Tor, uh, Tor, Tor is a great dog. I I I I met Tor back in 2011. He came to my clinic. It was an awesome dog. Nice yeah, he's amazing. We went, we went tracking with it. I, I tracked the dog out. Uh, it's super nice dog. Yeah. Uh, so the essence of of this kind of making the behavior the reason for the dog's existence requires the skill that only comes with either you being coached by a top level trainer or being part of an environment or many years themselves where you can learn slowly the, the art of the game. And this is, the, uh, this is where I see uh, people evolving. And from a club, you'll see someone coming in as a newbie with a new dog. And uh, they learn that this dog, even though they love it, uh, they really can't go beyond a particular level with that dog. And... At some point, the handler exceeds the dog in its capacity. The handler's capacity rises above that dog. Oh, so then, then, then they go and get the next dog. And typically, the next dog, they invariably get a Ferrari. So, so they, they start I with... I eat Malinois. No, they, they start with, no, no, they start with a Ford Escort, all right? And they did a, they do a few street races with that. They realize they can't, no matter how much they soup this, do, this car up, they can't really do anything better than that. So then they suddenly go to a, a Shelby GT, and then they suddenly realize that they don't have the driver skills, and they are crashing into the wall all the time with this dog. So then, and Usually at this point, the dog either bites them or they, they, they get a few, they get banged up and they get knocked around a little bit. And then they get to the next level. They get some rude awakenings is what they get. Exactly. And that's when they start realizing how to put them, that they have to do the must in. So they, they, they realize that, oh, they usually realize a little too late that they should have put the must in on this Ferrari when the dog was 12 weeks old. But right. they, they waited until it was 18 months old. And now the dog is, is really a powerhouse and they don't know how to go get past that. So then they go down the other route. They, they struggle with uh, how, do I, how do I say no to my dog? How do I lay the law down? How do I, how do I transcend these foundational boundaries uh, without losing myself as a person how you know because each one of them came into the sport with a lot of humanity with a lot of love for the dog so they struggle with that how do you redefine their love with what, what is there in front of them this this uh, this powerful predator that is one time loving and the next time and, you know, ready to eat them up. So how do they balance those two things? So then they get to the third dog and then they start putting the pieces together. Well, they start to realize too that the love that I show this dog is not the love that they show me back. 
Exactly. And it takes a long time for all that. To understand each part, it takes a long time. So now in this in this realm, in this, in this journey of growth from training behavior to training for competition, they also move through different coaches. Right. They go from coach A to B to C, and different coaches have their own different comfort levels of actually articulating the harsh truths of the realities of dog training, of comp competitive dog training. Because you have, people don't realize that high level competition dogs, they are, uh, they come with a full set of the predator behaviors. They are, a full, they are not your uh, couch potato dogs. They are, right. they, are act, they are like mini tigers and tigresses. And you need to learn how to. Do they have a lot of wild, wild in them. Would you say, or do they, they just have a lot of? Un, they just got a big engine, like you were saying with that Shelby engine. GT. You know, yeah, they got a big engine. They got a lot of power. They got a lot of willfulness, and they have the the initiative and the decision making capacity and the desire to exert their decision making capacity, such that if you cannot establish a strong pack structure very early on. They will rule the pack and you will be bottom dog. So You'll be that, a sucker. That's what I tell people. Your dog looks at you like a sucker. And yeah. when you hand them all this love and treats for nothing, they look at you like a sucker and they do not respect you. They they want, they actually look at you almost like, um, almost they, like. Um, they look at you like a midnight booty call. That's all it is. A big what? They look at you like a midnight booty call. Oh, <laughs> You're killing me. I got a little uh, respiratory thing going. Don't make me laugh, man. You're gonna, I'll be hacking for the next few minutes. But That's exactly a how late night booty call. So, so like just because it's it's a feel good, it's a feel good yeah. situation. Exactly. It's a and it's exactly. a it's a comfort and and not only that, but it's all also. Um, I mean, you can see it. You can see the. I mean, even when we do the MRI scans on pet dogs, the oxytocin. It lights up the oxytocin brain area in the brain where oxytocin is released, uh, or um, th that's the chemical that is uh, that that is emitted. And I, I I wonder if it's the same for working dogs. It I is. Wonder if we've ever done a, a, the all same thing. Them, all all dogs have the same neurochemistry. It's just the doses, the the amount of material being released is much, so much more higher. That's all. Mm. Uh, they, they all have the same neurochemistry. Now the well, yeah, go ahead, please. Well, I remember you saying earlier, and you're talking about people hopping back and forth to different experts, but you said earlier, learn slowly. So that's the, like you, you, you didn't just say learn, you just said learn slowly, right? And I think that uh, you kind of alluded to that on your next type of, uh, your, your next topic of, so, of people bouncing back and forth. So uh, what's the importance of learning slowly and processing and when you not learn. getting overwhelmed? When you learn, uh, see, there are two ways you can consume food. You can you can inhale food like a, like one big slurp and it goes in, and then it takes a while to get digested and absorbed. And sometimes you may just throw it back out. Right. But but if you take your time to masticate each each morsel, you will have a much better nutritional value over time, and you'll make progress faster. Learning slowly requires intellectual discipline. It requires the ability to, to stick with something. No, uh, to, to be able to hold your questions back. Mm. See, when, when you are with a trainer um, and the trainer is telling you something, most people are not listening to the trainer. They are listening to what they are saying in their head about what the trainer is saying. So there, therein is where a lot of things get lost in translation because what the trainer is saying is not the same as what you are saying that he is saying. Right, or what you're hearing. Any new information is first held against beliefs before it's even dissect or disseminated into critically thought. Right? Correct. And, and so, you know, for example, every one of my trainers, whether it was Bart or whether it was uh, Wallace, 
um, or Tobias or T. Floyd, I have gone back two years later to what they said, and I have understood what they said completely differently than what I understood the first time over. Yeah. Every time, every time, because they, because the, there is always in, in the information you get from a, from a top level trainer, from a master, the information is never, never one piece of information. In every word and every sentence of theirs is layered. It is actually, it is literally like, like a, a samurai sword, multiple folded layers that you can unpack. And depending on your level of skill, you'll unpack it differently. Yes. And uh, sometimes I have found insights in something that I heard from a top level coach several years later in some completely unrelated situation. And suddenly I said, damn it, I can use that piece of information differently here. And this, this nuanced onion peel nature of knowledge is something that is characteristic of training under a top level trainer. Well, it's characteristic of knowing thyself too, right? Correct. It, it's Correct. getting in deeper to those layers, those innermost layers. And all this is, I mean, ultimately, even though we're going to other trainers, we're using them to help them know ourselves. And just like you were speaking about earlier and choosing that dog, not based on personal preferences, but ultimate so, performance. So uh, let me explain to you. My first dog was chosen for me. It was my, uh, from a, by a friend of mine. It was a beautiful black and red show line shepherd, and he could really work. And we did a lot of things together. I learned a lot of things to him, with him. But he had his limitations as a dog, as a, with the size of his engine. And but it was a great starter dog. Then my next dog, I went all the way to the extreme. I went to a powerhouse, and I was nowhere equipped to handle the powerhouse. You're um, speaking from experience here. Yeah. My third dog, I did completely differently. For the first time, I took a dog and I did not get emotionally invested in the dog until almost 18 months into its life. For so, the first 18 months, I, I remember talking to Wallace saying that, I don't know, we'll see if this dog is going to stay with me or not. I might, I might give him up. Based on your, <laughs> second, your second dog in the powerhouse, how did you know? that that dog was not right for you, the powerhouse, the second dog. Oh, the, my, my powerhouse was always right for me. I was not right for the dog. Oh. <laughs> so I, 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 I needed to grow as a handler, and he made me grow. And he's my now my 11-year-old retired competition dog. Okay. He, did a lot, he did a lot of things before he got injured and had his competition career uh, terminated. But, but he's still one of the best dogs I had. But... You know, we didn't accomplish as much as I could have if I had been a better head. And so the third dog, not emotionally invested. And how did you yes. know that it was your dog? That's 18 months. Well, for the first time in my third dog, I actually got a dog because I wanted to compete. I wanted to actually do IGP in a way that was meaningful. And so all throughout, his puppy life, I kept the dog a little bit aloof from me and just looked at it as, okay, what do you have to do? What can you do? Let me see what you can do. And my relationship with the dog was more like an employer and an employee rather than having... So in my practice, at some point in my past, I had my wife work for me. Now, uh -oh. when, when you have a family member work for you, it's not the same as having an employee work for you. Not at all. All right. So my second There's dog, no separation. You know, there's no separation. It goes my, right from house to work, to house. To, yeah. yeah. My, my second dog was like having my wife work for me. My third dog was having a true employee. Did you have a kennel that the dog stayed in separate from your house? Uh, for the first 12 months, yeah. Okay. And now he stays in, a, in my house, but he still stays separate from the rest of the house 
except for defined periods of time. Um, but he stays in my house. But for the first 12 months, he was in the kennel. And I would, I would spend time with him in the kennel. I would go in, I would play, move, and all of that. But he still stayed in the kennel. And you treat him like an employee. Yeah. And now he... Separation. Yeah. Now, so now he has earned that. Yeah. Uh, he's now three years old. He's now earned the right to be uh, what I call uh, administrative level employee. There he's you go. An, I love it. He's still an employee, but he's an administrative level employee. Yeah, a little bit more compensation, a little bit more um, responsibilities, yeah. right? And a little bit more, a little bit more authority, and a little bit more recognition, also more, right. more, more accountability, and a more, more uh, appreciation as, hey, yeah, man, you're a cool guy. So yeah. you know yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So this is the what I see as the evolution. And in this evolution, people, I and almost everyone else, they get helped by various coaches. Yes. But different coaches, like I said before, they differ in their ability and their willingness to un unmask the harsh realities of training. And uh, in this, I, I see a lot, see, there is what I, in my field, I tell people the science of medicine is different than the business of medicine. Exactly. So, so and the life, business of medicine could use an evolution, I believe, especially after this whole pandemic. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the business of medicine sometimes deliberately avoids. Uh, the promotion of good medication because it is not suitable for the business model of the business of medicine. Yes, it doesn't it affect the bottom line in the way that is more beneficial. Exactly. Um, the I, I give you you don't need to go far into something very simple. Insulin, for example. Yes. Insulin literally was found the patent of Banting and Best, they, from McGill University in Canada, they donated to the world for $1 sum. They released all rights to insulin. Awesome. And yet that one, that free drug is now being sold at $600 a month supply. And that is the business of medicine. And the reason for that is that insulin by itself is still ridiculously cheap. Yes. They monetized insulin by putting it into a syringe and that auto injects doses and they have a patent on the spring loaded device that auto injects. And therefore that device and since they will not sell insulin in bottles anymore, and the federal government in collusion with the big industry allows them to do that under the guise of saving people from getting overdosed with insulin because people are not, are, are not smart enough to take the dose by themselves. Yes. So these are the which, ways, that, which is way. nonsense, you know, because yeah, people yeah. are so perfectly these are the capable. Ways in which the business of it. So, like that, the business of dog training requires the sanitization of the harsh realities of dog training, especially high level competition. So well, that's why Petco and PetSmart, I call it HR, like putting the dog training course through HR Fortune 500 company. Oh, not just Petco and PetSmart. You can go to all the high level competition seminars. They all do the same thing. The Interesting. Top, the top comp IGP competition seminars will talk about, about all the motivational methods of wanting the dog to like doing something, but they will never talk about the must key. They, there are only two dog trainers that I have known who talk about the must key openly, Wallace and Bart. 
Everyone else doesn't talk about it. But they all use it privately. And this is one of the reasons this, this fundamental uh, dishonesty in the presentation of dog training is why I don't like to go and attend many seminars because I find that disingenuous. Because what happens is the people who go to the seminar, they think that they will understand how to trade it and succeed at the same level as these, do these trainers are doing. And they get a rude awakening when they go to the trial. They can't succeed at that level. Because suddenly the dog thinks that it has an option because the behavior has not been made into an existential must for the dog. The dog has and, figured out that there's other possibilities and whenever exactly. they get overwhelmed or whenever they get confronted with something that... They, uh, they have an option of doing some other thing. And that is not oh, acceptable. Exactly. And they, they only find it out on trial day. And that... Why is, why is that? Because the person is nervous. Everything's different. I remember one day Bart telling me that his first trial... He was sitting out there and he was just kind of relaxing in a lawn chair and everybody's scurrying around and being crazy. And he's wondering and they're and they're wondering what the hell he's doing. And mm -hmm. he's just like, I'm, I'm sitting here. My dog's fine. My dog's <laughs> good. I don't need to practice my dog. And they thought he was crazy and he won the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. With flying Wallace, colors. Wallace never goes and practices. He goes to the world championship and doesn't practice. Not on. Everyone goes to the, uh, the stadium and have their practice session. Wallace yeah. goes to the stadium and leaves the dog behind in the hotel. He goes and he'll walk the state. He'll walk the route. He'll just walk, uh, counting some strides here, there. That's it. It's for himself too. It's not for yeah. anybody else. Yeah, that's it. And he hardly ever he hardly ever practices. Never. And he trains like that. He trains to get the dog to not need practice. So people. People, this is what I have seen. I have seen all the top seminar trainers. Every one of them I have gone and seen. And the only ones that I have to this year, in, 20, in almost 20 years of dog training, there are only two trainers who are honest, openly honest about how they put the must key. Bart and Wallace, no one else. And those are two of the top. Yeah, Bart doesn't compete, Wallace does. Well, and Bart and Wallace had a video together too. Yeah. Th that so. I was talking to Bart about. Um, the, with the G big German Shepherd, the dueling dogs, when they started to go out there and they were just having, just working their dogs and all of a sudden they said, let's work them together. And this crazy German Shepherd that Wallace had, I mean, you could see the size of this dog. He's like a Hulk. Right, and that was one of the things that I really was impressed. I'll, I'll find it really quick. Let me put it up here. Not Wallace, Bart and Bart and. Uh, was Frank that? Am I Rot thinking? No, 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 it is not Wallace. Frank oh. Rotleb, Frank Rotleb and Bart below. Oh, okay. Maybe I was Bart, saying the wrong Bart, person. Bart, Bart with Thor and Frank Rotleb with his German Shepherd. They both work together uh, doing blind uh, bark and hold of the blind. And there's Michael as well. Yeah. And then here, let's see, dueling dogs. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, Bart, Bart posted that video up. It is, I saw that a, lot, a while ago. Well, I am still looking for it here. Oh, there's. Everybody's going through the Napopo Silver School. And uh, the crazy thing is, is that, you know, at the end of the silver school, I was sitting back there and I was just so relieved because I, I got through it and um, it was a pain, man. It was one of the, one of the hardest experiences that I've ever, I've ever gone through and, and uh, one of the most challenging experiences I've ever gone through. And uh, Bart came out and he says to me, uh, what did you think about that whole thing? And he and uh, we're having a barbecue and stuff, and everybody's happy, and you know, and uh, 
he basically stated, "Hey, man, do you think that that was um, na- that that in itself was na po po the the experience that I went through in that class?" Right? Is yeah, is, and that's what he explained to me is is like they're walking the walk and they overlay their philosophy with the teachings that they that they instill within you too. And I remember sitting there. And just like, yeah, that was Napopo, but look at how I feel right now. Look at how accomplished I feel. And he's just walking up to me totally calm. And it was almost like I was one of, you know, I was some like a dog or something. Like, like not really, but in a way I was. I was I was something that he taught in the methodology that he has founded. And it worked. And it's great to put yourself in the perspective of of what you're teaching and and how it affects others and the best knowledge in my experience and uh in my opinion was knowledge through experience right gnosis that's what we call gnosis uh, instead of just reading about something um you know walk in the field or doing um you know actually doing it uh, is a whole different uh ball game than 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 just thinking about it i, I should say yeah right the the essence of uh so when when you start training, um, if you understand competition level training as Na- Navy SEAL Hell Week, then okay. you are in a better position to understand what training for high level competition is about. Well, and I'm it's, I'm having a it Navy is actually, SEAL because that's what they do, right? They they make for those seals they make the execution of each of those behaviors existential they make it their entire life depends on whether they do it or not oh man we're going to see something here and i'm going to have on monday i have an army ranger joining us and i have a navy seal friend and i also have a green beret friend and we're going to talk about resilience which is bouncing back and that's what we're talking about with the dogs too yeah and And all these people who, quote unquote, talk about animal welfare and understanding, they have no clue of what it means to make a warrior's welfare. What is welfare for a warrior? What is welfare? Let me show you, too. Let me show you something here, doctor. Okay. Now, this is what uh, a protocol is for the Navy SEALs here. Or excuse me, this is the Marines here that they're doing. Uh, U.S. Marines intense underwater training here. And when I play it, can you see my screen? Not yet. Oh, hold on one second. All righty. <clears throat> okay, yeah. here it is. Yeah. So they okay. tie his shoes or tie his feet here. Let's. I'm going to yeah. open this up here. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Big breath. And what they do is this guy's going to panic. He has no, it's natural for you to panic. It's natural for you to, um, well, and this isn't really the one that I was thinking about, but in the Navy SEALs, they actually make them, this is crazy, mm-hmm. but they make them carry these tanks where they have, they actually force these Navy SEALs to black out. And that's what's going to happen here is this guy's going to black out. Boom. Mm-hmm. Or no, he's doing he's doing this where he's got to get him the mask on. Dang, it's so crazy. But this is type of like sport dog stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And learning when to calm, when to explode. He's got the expert, or looks like he's got another person next to him. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> this wasn't what I was thinking about. But this is kind of what I'm talking about with the competition um, versus behavior. You know what I'm saying? Like these guys are putting themselves in situations where they are learning about themselves and their capabilities as individuals and their body's capabilities as well. They push them to this level where they... So uh, I I had a training session a week ago with a very skilled uh, helper and with my current competition dog and he was teaching the dog how to exert power without going crazy Mm. but 
instead of trying to encourage the dog, what he was doing, and this was amazing what he was doing, he, he actually was making the dog really come up in full aggression and still teaching the dog to be focused and clear in the head. And he was, he was literally forcing my dog to remain calm and clear, no matter how hard the fight was going. Wow. And, and the, the effect of it was at the end of it, my dog was even better off at the end of it. He, he, his power went up, his grips became even more powerful. And it was, and when, he, and at the end of that, when he won the, won the sleep, it was like, my dog was so amped up after that. He was like, he was, it, it was, a, it was a completely different level for, for me as well as my dog. And that is what we talk about in building resilience. You can't build resilience by not challenging the dog to overcome. And taking but, it to its ultimate threshold as well. Exactly. And a lot of the top trainers, they understand how to build resilience. They also understand which dogs deserve to be built up in resilience and which dogs should be left alone. There are some dogs that cannot be built up in resilience. They don't have it. They don't have the necessary uh, hardware or the neurochemistry or the neuro, ne uh, neural network in them to sustain that kind of pressure and be successful. And the top trainers understand which dogs have to be said, no, this is it. You don't get to this level. That's right. You get cut from the program. Yeah. That's just how we do no, it. That's just how and, it has and, to be done. And this is where uh, a lot of people who come into this game, having just picked up a dog out of the love for the dog, mm. suddenly become uh, disappointed. They they realize that they, they can't reach that level. And they're... So... For them, they they can still find contentment and satisfaction at at a at a lower level of, of competition, but if you are seriously looking at high level competition, you need to be able to do this, and you need to be able to understand how to get to the must level of dog training. You know, one more thing: if you look at a recent uh, set of competitions that happened um, in the selection trials for uh, the WSV, you will find that a lot of dogs, they got screened out at, uh, they, they flub basic exercise. Like they'll say they won't, they won't uh, out on the sleeve and they get disqualified because of that. Or they don't, uh, they don't go down on an article of the track and they lose points critical points and they fail in the program because of that and don't get selected for the uh, ch world championship team. But if you start asking the question, why is it that you have a high level dog that actually competed at a national level, got came all the way to the selection trials and then fail in an out, you realize it comes because the dog faced that level of pressure at that high level of pressure, the dog simply cannot execute the exercise and feel calm enough and confident enough to out. Yeah. It is not, it, it's just that the level of fight drives them to that high level where they lose clarity of thought and they can't, they can't hear the handler yelling out and it doesn't happen. One of, the, one of the best ways for them to explore that world is with their mouth, too. And I think that that yeah. transmutes in frustration, transmutes confusion, you know, all that stuff, right? Yeah, and that is where this whole idea of resilience comes in. Training the dog in aggression, training the dog in drive, training it at the high level where it has to perform existentially even when the world is going to shit all around it. Everything is falling apart, but it still has to perform. That is 
top level training and not not many people are capable of doing that same thing with the navy seals i mean just look at the ones that volunteer in the program how many get dropped and how many cool. walk over to that bell bing and, the, and they yeah. ring the bell themselves right because yeah, they, they yeah. pulled themselves out of it yeah. and uh because it just becomes too much or they crack under that pressure or they get injured or there's a number of things that happen but I mean, once they've shown their hand, they've shown you. And it's our, yeah. it's our responsibility, our ability to respond to that, 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 that we must listen to that dog. And I think that it boils down to, Doc, is people trying to think with their emotions a lot of times. Where you can't think with your emotions. Emotions are something separate than our logic. And just because you love this animal doesn't make it capable of things that it's not capable of. Um, that brings me to another point, which I realized when I started moving around with the high level trainers is that these people uh, see their dogs as, as athletes for a purpose. And if, if they, if they don't, if they find that their athlete in their team is not capable of performing. They don't get. Uh, they don't keep, retain the athlete just because they love the dog. A lot of other people they have the dog primarily um, because well. they they want a companion, yes. and the, the competition is a secondary uh, feature because of that. Mm -hmm. Now. I am like that. I'm like, for example, this dog. That if it doesn't, if it doesn't pan out in competition for me, my third dog, I'll keep the dog until it dies. I'm not going to suddenly dump him and go to another dog. But he's an administrator but, now. But I know that I'm going to do that. I know that I'm. That is my choice that I will compete on those terms. But I don't fool myself thinking that I am the same level as a top level competitor because for the top level competitor, for the Debbie Zapiers, the Mike Deals, the Wallace Payne's, the Mike Sweeney's of the world, for them, the dog is an athlete in a program. Yes. And they will not, they will not, if the athlete does not pan out, they will get another dog and compete with that dog. Well, I remember Fred Hassan said, and Fred Fred is a good trainer as well. Yes. Um, and uh, I remember him saying, like, when you go, like, when they go and look at uh, college prospects, are they looking at the babies or are they looking at high schoolers? Like, and I was asking him, do you want to get a puppy or do you want to get an older dog? And he's like, sometimes you don't know until that dog's older what they're yeah. capable of they're not going to go and it's like either if that was the case and michael jordan's kids would all be professional like basketball players or whatever like yeah, we have to look at what what this dog evolves into and what this dog shows as its own intrinsic desires and sometimes that doesn't show up until a little bit later and, and yeah, the uh, nba draft is not done at high school the nba draft or is not at college level or at two or three years old, right? Yeah. It's like it's it's done when it's when these these uh, people have reached a certain age, and then they have shown that they have the capabilities of performing exactly. at that level. And even that isn't a guarantee of success, right? right? Even that, like a lot of people crack under the pressure. We have the thirty by or thirty for thirty on ESPN, where they have all these stories about people that have gotten. Uh, you know, just weren't cut out for these roles that they were put into, and it and it led to a disastrous lifestyle where they are a lot worse than they were when they got into these sports, and and that goes to the degree of like knowing what you're getting into, knowing what you're doing, having good coaches, having good mentors, right? Oh, and, you, you, and being able to listen to them, uh, being able to. Uh, be coachable, be teachable. How do you recommend people do that? I, I, whenever I go to something, I pretend like I've never trained a dog. I, pre I try to pretend like I am fresh. I pretend, try to go in with no um, as assumptions and, and try to be a blank slate. Even if something I think is pure bullshit, I'm, I'm listening to every aspect of it because there might be a pearl or a situation. What do you recommend, Doc? Well, 
I have, uh, when I go and train with anyone, once I decide that somebody is who I'm going to train with, at that point, I hand over the keys to my dog, to that person. I do wow. not, I completely trust the person. I completely trust the person to the extent that if my, I, I am, I will no longer, uh, like, I, I have this ability to do that and I've done it all the time. I've done it consistently that when I go to train with somebody and once I have made the decision that this person is who I'm going to train with, I will not ask any questions beyond doing what I have. The only thing that I, um, I completely will uh, abandon a trainer uh, in a heartbeat is if the person is, um, every time I have walked away from a trainer, it is because they were disrespectful uh, or they were dishonest in their training. By that sugar was, coating stuff, by not going the whole, the no, whole way, not showing. Uh, two, two, uh, one, two trainers. I walked away because they, they were. How do I put it? Uh, they would take me for granted. They would take. Mm -hmm. They would take. They they would take me for that. Uh, I was a patsy for whatever they would want. Okay. And on, in those cases, I, even though they were excellent trainers, I walked away because it was it was not a relationship that I could work with. Um, the the trainers that I stuck with, and who I to this day I I speak of with uh, respect, uh, are people who never try to use me in any way, but would, would train honestly. Um, so that was something that is very important for me when I, when I work with somebody. Excellent. Uh, they, uh, but, but when I go to a trainer, it's once I decide that I'm going to train, it's like, I will, I will listen and I will, I, I'll suspend judgment completely. Yes. And that's what I was trying to say earlier. I am very good at this personally. I can remain, I can put my questions on hold and I can remain in a state of not understanding, not knowing and wait patiently for the understanding to descend mm. for weeks at a time. Fantastic. Uh, I, I'm comfortable not being in that space of, uh, of unsurety. Um, that I, think is, I that is that is my personal hallmark in all my fields in every field I do whether it's medicine science I'm very comfortable in that state of ambiguous nebulous not knowing finding out but not not uh, yet having all the answers and not becoming threatened by the fact that I don't know that is uh, is uniquely me. I, it always happens for me. I can do it. To observe without reaction, and to be able to piece together. And to I remember first time we spoke at the various how you said, "I'm really good at pattern recognition," yeah. and that's what this is all about. I and mean, pretty soon it takes a while. And I say the understanding is like your foundation. And that's what you build upon is your understanding. And sometimes that, that foundation is going to take a while to get built and get to a place that you can build upon it. And if you also look at like the allegorical term of understanding, you're walking around and you're so comfortable with something that you will stand under it, that you understand it, that, that that's how, how knowledgeable you are, that you are uh, perfectly comfortable and confident um, with building upon and and um, and and taking and, dis and 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 taking the grant what we call grammar right the 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 information piecing it together and then we disseminate it through our logical process and then no, once we have distilled it then we speak actually, the truth 
it's actually a little bit more than being comfortable or confident about it. It is. Well, sometimes reason, you are uncomfortable. No, no. The the reason why I'm comfortable by in the learning process of not knowing answers and being staying in that state of not knowing is because I really love the learning process. So I get my comfort from the fact that I am learning rather than actually see once you know the answer you stop learning because you have closed the door your belief your belief is formed and just like i was saying earlier any yeah. new information first held against belief before it's allowed into the mind yeah. where you're saying i'm taking this belief this belief wall and then i'm just letting things into my mind letting them into so, my mind and letting them happen so so always the ability to ask a question the ability to stay in the question is far more powerful than the ability to actually arrive at an answer. Because once you have the answer, what happens is you have closed the possibility to anything new. You already know it. This is it. This is how it is going to be. And nothing else is possible. So I, I, I'm comfortable. I like answers. But I hold answers as, okay, this situation, this time, this is good. And we will see if it's good everywhere else, and I'll go forward with it. And that's how I do my medicine. That's how I do my science. That's how I discover or create my nutritional products. That's how I do dog training. Everything is a process of learning and holding, being comfortable in that state of learning rather than uh finding the safety of the answer do you know this is this is that reminds me of a quote that i just put up in the comments here ready learning is the question what is the answer <laughs> you know so learning is the actual like because it's yeah. always a constant source of evolution where we aren't once we think we know it we're dead in the water man we're dead in the water we're number two the dog dog number two coming up after us because we don't know what we don't know still, right? And just knowing and being in that observer, that awareness, right? And just being able to learn without having those belief structures keep this, the information out, right? And that's where that, that that's what the quote came into my mind. Learning is the question, what is the answer? Because <laughs> I always like to just like, let's learn, let's, let's learn, let's find stuff out. And there's nothing with compassion, love, and acceptance, and truth, understanding that we can't discuss, I don't think, you know? But it's also yeah. that relationship that you have and that rapport is powerful, not just with the dog that you're working with, but with the, tr the, the teachers and coaches that we choose to learn from. And then when we do choose to learn from that, that mentor, how to become that open vessel, right? Where you're, you're filled mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's a there's a way of processing it, too, because like you said earlier, two years later, that statement mean, meant something completely different to you than yes. when you initially heard it. Right. And so there's yeah. a gestation period. There's a time that this knowledge grows into something else. Yeah. So that is for me, that is the most exciting part. The fact that uh, I can. Uh, come and take the same piece of information and suddenly come at a completely set of different answers just because sort of time has passed and then I'm coming back to the same. It's like opening a book and reading a new story every time you open it. It's, 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 it's pretty cool, actually. It's a lot of fun doing that. Well, I know, and you said the nutritional supplements. How I know that there's a story behind that. Yeah, there's a, there's a very interesting story. <laughs> The story actually, the one of the things that happened as I was doing medicine is the recognition that most people are getting diseases because their body is basically breaking down from the fire of their own metabolism. People don't realize this, but 
the our life is a fire in us there is a fire burning in us that generates uh, useful energy but it also generates toxic byproducts and these toxic these toxic byproducts have to be detoxified and disposed by the body all the time and the reason why a 16 year old falls and bounces while a 60 year old falls and goes plop the reason for that is the metabolic fire in a 16 year old is so much more resilient and is so much more uh, regenerative at that age compared to at the age of 60 and it is not because they have different metabolisms they actually have the same metabolism but there are genetic pathways that get down regulated and downgraded as we get older and we lose our ability to to regenerate ourselves minute by minute hour by hour day by day and that is the essence of what i call vitality or youth so i was always looking at how do i you know it's one thing to heal somebody but how do you capture vitality so what is the difference between being vital and being healthy what is there is a certain essence there's a certain immortality in life that right that is so evident in the very young you know in the they just 14, came through the veil the veil of life that's what i call it yeah. right that just came so, through they so when you look at that and my question was always why, where does that essence of immortality go where do they go you know why is it that i am not able to perform like i used to be my like my 16 year old self performed i'm not able to perform now what happened my mind is still as young as a 16 year old but why is it that my body doesn't perform at that level what is the secret that i lost along the way and as i started looking into that i found that there are actual biological botanicals and there are marine biological compounds that can reverse or can attenuate that process and uh, i started concocting since i have a chemistry background i ha- i have a protein and peptide chemistry i have biochemistry i, I know all the stuff so i basically created a, a lab in my basement and i you know uh, you know put together st- stuff and started making it and i and i created an, an a liniment that then became very popular and uh, i started using that for arthritis pain and muscle strains and it was very very popular then my dog got injured um, my first dog got injured and i rubbed the liniment on him and he got better so i started using the liniment on dogs that would pull their muscles and strain and they all started getting better so then there was this guy uh, by the name of victor armandaris in california and mm-hmm. southern he's actually um, he his specialty is doing patios and uh, brick walkways and things like that he's very good at that that's all you just got a brick walkway too that you posted yeah about. yeah 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 So he he had a has a dog with the name of Gonzo that got injured and uh, he had to bench the dog for the one competition season and then he started using my liniment and it was started to get back so he asked me hey can you make me some kind of nutritional supplement to help Gonzo along in his recovery he's using the liniment he's doing great but i would like to build a muscle and stuff like that so uh so i went back to my basement and i put together a bunch of uh, biological cells I, i made a kilogram of stuff and I, i shipped it out to him and he called me back after four weeks saying that hey gonzo is doing great he's uh, it's amazing stuff so when can you make make more of it i said wait a minute i i have to i have not yet manufactured it yet yours was just a test batch that i sent out so 
out of that came Atlas, and Atlas became very, very popular since 2019. April. Field tested, folks. Field tested. <laughs> 2019 April and it went on through April through the pandemic then in 2020 uh, we uh, started uh, making a human version of Atlas that we call Zeus that we started using and that was became very popular and then in 2020 we also started using it in COVID patients and people from COVID after they got recovered they would recover faster they had less amount right. of, uh, of aches and pains and all of that happened in tw until 2021 the pandemic and the supply chain all uh, put a crimp in our plants and now we are all out of stock on all of that and we are okay. trying to trying to leverage uh, manufacture into a different platform but but that essentially is my nutritionals that we are right now uh, atlas and zeus are still very much in the market and i i'm hopeful that i should be able to get them back on production again by september or october which right now they're out of stock because the raw materials are being held up and we are in short supply for the raw materials yeah. unlike other people i don't you know i manufacture it myself i don't give it to some contract manufacturer to make and give to me i wow. so uh, so there is no uh, there is no, no third party. It's just you. It's all uh, you. The raw material is sourced by me, and uh, they come here. Then we we blend it, we mix, we we package it. Uh, all of that has been doing by ourselves. Um, to the next level, um, I already know that these products are extremely powerful. They are being used all over the world. My problem right now is uh, scaling it up into a major production because right now it was very much at the R&D level, a very small scale venture. So yeah, yeah. now, now we, are uh, we are trying to get it scaled up to a big manufacturing level. So those are questions that are being answered even as we speak. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, some growing pains happen. A lot of moving parts, especially when you start to look at logistics and, and yeah, that uh, was like all these different yeah. products coming in. One thing can hold up the whole program, man. You know that 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 is the other thing because I am not really my strength is creating. I I am happiest when I am making and creating the idea of the product or something else. But this whole business of uh, running an assembly line, working out inventory. I can tell by just your, your, your posture you know, and everything. Like, oh, I'm like. <laughs> all of that. No, I mean, you know, figuring out how to, how to package the material. What is the yeah, branding? Yeah. What is the photograph? How does it look like? What are the wordings? You know, the legalese behind it. All of that is very painful for me. Yeah, I, 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 I don't. I, uh, so I, what I have been looking for in transiting is, hey, how can I, you know, I right now own 90% of the company, but I'm willing to walk away with just 10%. Somebody else take over the whole thing. I'll I will give you the ideas and I'll, I will be the idea man behind it and continue to do that. But, yeah, yeah. So, so we are looking at some people who are interested in playing that game. So we'll see. There's a lot of people out there, especially now with the shakeup of the world, you know, and and the evolution, and you know, it's it's something that is not necessarily a bad thing, right? We live in the no. universe, right? The uni is one, like unicycle and verse versares change, and so the one constant that is here is change, right? And just like we converse, we come together to change, right? And uh, oh, and so I like the way that you say that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Con con is like congress, convene, uh, congregate, um, and then verse verse are right. Converse and so the universe converse um, change is something that should be embraced. And and uh, I love the aspect of this of like knowing thyself. I believe that that is the purpose of our life is to know ourselves. And and in doing so, you're going to uncover a lot of treasures, but you're going to have to sift through a lot of um, a lot of junk to get there, man. And, and uh... it's knowing yourself is one thing, but for me, 
Um, life for me, for my personal view on how life is, is uh, there's only one purpose in my mind for life. And that is to empower, empower people. There's no other purpose. There's no other purpose for life. Um, and I, in my um, Facebook, how do you think uh, the best way to empower people is, Doc? What do you What do you think? The, is there Is there a certain way, or is it Is it per individual or per situation? You know, for me, uh, for the the way I look at it is, every one of us have many talents, and we have one gift. The purpose of life is to find out what that gift is. That's the, that's the first thing. You find out what the gift is. Right. And then use all your talents in the service of the gift. Whenever mm. I have, see, I have, my gift is I can heal people. That You're is my healer. gift. You're a healer and a teacher too, I think. Yeah. So my gift, that is my gift, that, nothing else. But I have many talents. Like I, I, I am eloquent. I have a sharp brain. I, yeah. I'm, okay. You know, I have all these other talents, and as and what I have found is whenever I have used my talents in the service of my gift, I have always succeeded. But whenever I have mistaken any of my talents as my gift, I have always failed. So the key is. To find your talent, to find your gift, use your talents in the service of your gift, and use your gift to empower. You know, in my uh, on my Facebook page, I have the statement: only one reason for life. Believe you can give back to people and work to find a way to do it. That's it. I love it. You know, and and what do you tell people that have that to believe that they don't have any purpose in life? Uh, that belief itself is uh, is pointing to them the need for them to find the purpose. They're just along the path somewhere that is See, maybe dark. Darkness only in is darkness has no existence except because it's the absence of light. That's right. See, so what is not there is not there. It. Something that is not there can never become something. Wow. You know, so darkness is has no real existence. It is it is so only because there is no light. And to remove darkness, you don't need to go and chase darkness. All you have to do is light a candle. Yeah. And darkness gets dispelled automatically. Same with empowerment. You don't need to uh, make people more uh, successful or anything of that sort. All you have to do is make them believe. You don't need to make a dog uh, succeed. You have to just empower the dog. The dog will find the way by itself. And then along the way, you choose those dogs that will find the highest way. That's right. And using That's that right. structure that the dog benefits from that we, we talked about earlier, the sleep, yeah. the eat, the chase, yeah. Um, and and sometimes the mate, you know, and and yeah. and using yeah. those constructions yeah. and, and the, the knowledge of the dog and and structuring that relationship in a way that is almost a professional. Yes, that is right. That's it's like it, that's... you're not being very professional. Like if we're in a situation like that's inappropriate. We're in a professional situation. That's how I view the sport dog world. Like that's a very professional situation and that is a totally different set of standards than we're taking in a casual environment. And then that's going to be our, uh, remember the training of my competition dog is not the same as training dogs. That's the casual environment is the training dogs, cool. right? And then the professional button up performance and like the egoic, the egoic, but also the evolutionary process of learning and growth is yeah. in, in, in that profession. Right. And, and that's yeah. the standards that, that, that lay the foundation for the growth of, of all the, the progressive of that whole sport. Right. And all dogs within that sport to the next level. And um, yeah, yeah, there's definitely a place for it. And, you know, we rely on these dogs. We, these dogs, 
when when we're not working at them in sport, when we're taking these dogs and they're going with the Navy SEALs and we're training these these protection dogs that are really going into a war zone, then it becomes not not points on a piece of paper, but it becomes no. life and death, right? Yeah. It becomes um, yeah. uh, something that will affect if that dog does not perform, um, the outcome could be detrimental. Yeah. Awesome, Doc. Well, how do people, I mean, so you don't have any, any products now. Um, what well, do you recommend when people want to get Atlas or? Uh, well, we, we do have products. Uh, we, oh, you do? We, we have Ayura, but we, uh, Atlas is out of stock and so is Zeus, but uh, it should be back on the shelf again. What's by, the, uh, where do they get it from? September of two. Oh, the website is uh, activepower.com, A-C-T-I-V-P-O-W-E-R.com. Active par, T-O. Activepower.com. That's the name of the company, Active Power Incorporated. I can. Let me share. Yeah, just type it in here. I'll put yeah. it in this. Can I can chat. I share my screen? Uh, you can, but um, I don't know. Can you hit share screen? Can you do it? No, no. Let me. Uh, How do I? Yeah. What's I put the website here? Yeah, I, I can I can share. I can hit share. Share. Well, you video. can hit share. Share yeah. screen. Yeah. Yeah, cool, yes. man. I didn't know that. I didn't know people could share the screen. I thought I was the only one. Yeah. We'll see here. Okay. Yeah. 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 So entire screen. Share system audio. Okay. Share. Is that doing it? No, you have you have to you have to make me presenter. Oh, I do. Here, let's see here. Edit mic. I don't. I, I don't know. Banned from studio. <laughs> It says that I can't do anything with you here. Screen sharing was canceled. Make sure you click share on. Share, share screen. I don't mm -hmm. have any clue. Screen sharing works. Uh, share screen. How do you spell the website again? I'll just, uh, that's all I need. Uh, Active, wait. Okay, I got it. I uh, got it. Oh, there it goes. Okay, cool. Add to stream. Okay, one second, one second. Whoa. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Tell me when you're ready, and then I'll do it. Uh, I'm sharing something here. I want to show, I want That's to cool, show. man. Doc, you did, you're showing me stuff I had no clue about here. One second. Are you able to see this? Yeah. Here, I'll put it. Tell me when you want it on the screen. One second. Uh, or if you want, I think you can. It, can you hover over the, the picture down below as it say add to stream? Yeah, one second. When I'm cool, uh, man. No, stream you are sharing your screen and audio. Yeah, no, it's saying that you are seeing it. One second. Uh, here it is. Or do you want me to move it? Active yeah, power. There it is. Yeah, one second. No, not this one. Uh, one second. Sorry. You're good. I'm just stoked that I'm learning stuff. Let me see if this is it. I just drank a big thing of coffee, too. I'm never yeah. going to sleep tonight. Yeah. All right, here it is. You ready? Add it to the stream. Here we go. Life begins with 500 million sperm. Racing towards a single egg. Can you hear the audio? Nope. No, it's okay though. And so life or our dreams, sometimes the audio will get me demonetized or whatever they each optical along the way and making us doubt what is possible. We got pins in our ankle. We got cancer, chemotherapy. We're learning to walk again, but whether your race is to be the best or simply better than yesterday, the body is capable of more than we give it credit for. Absolutely. Fantastic. When it's counterintuitive, the body is given what it needs. If wisdom, knowledge, and science, the true potential, then its true potential is unleashed. Given our bodies and minds the power to outrun, outpace, and outlast any challenge, 
and the freedom to pursue ever possible every possible joy life has to offer. There's that dang Jack Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's having fun. Living yeah. life to its fullest, man. Active power, IRX. That's awesome, Doc. There we go. Equus. That's all you do with horses, too. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. So activepower.com. That's the... Yeah. Active power. I'm gonna put that in the in the comments.com. And then do you want me to take down the screen or do you want me to yeah, you can. Yeah, that's it. stop the stop the shirt? There you go. Place. There you got it. You shirt. got it. Activepower.com. I put it in the comments there. Um yeah. check it out. And yeah, maybe when when it does come back and I'll I'll definitely do a product review and stuff. I'll open it up and do an unboxing and um is it just for performance dogs? Um, Atlas is for any dog at any age, regardless of uh, whether it's a competition dog. Uh, you we uh, you can put a dog from six months to twelve years old. Uh, okay. It works. Um, it's it's amazingly tolerated very well across the breed. Uh, we have had very very very. We had so far, since 2019, we had only two dogs that, three dogs that did not tolerate the supplement. Uh, and uh, usually because they, they, they had diarrhea, but there was only three dogs out of, I think, several hundred dogs that have been done so far. You know, um, doctor, this makes me think of it. I always get called of it, especially now with the cannabis being legal. And I'm kind of hippy dippy anyway, that people feel safe calling me whenever their dog eats cannabis. And, um, and it really affects the dog. Like it, it messes. I mean, the THC, it, the dog will lose continence, will, will poop all over themselves, will, will die, will can't walk their motor function. But the thing is, is that if you give it some time, and allow it to just kind of wear its way, itself off. I've never ever had a dog uh, pass away or anything like that. But what I found out, Doc, is that if you give these dogs whole milk yogurt, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, they're fine. I mean, they're not 100%, but they're about 85% faculties are back. Wow. And so I, I don't know what's in the whole milk yogurt. I don't know. And it can't be low fat or anything. It's got to be the fat. And I know that it's a fatty lipid. The mm -hmm. actual the cannabis oil itself is, and that allows it to squish through the blood brain barrier. But I just wanted to, to mention that to you that the whole milk yogurt it's got to have a blocker or something in it because you can actually see the dog start to come back. And and the other thing too is that when the dog starts to get overdosed with any type of cannabis, you see the dog flinch and do like that's the start of the motor function type of misfire oh. or something, you know. So anytime that I uh, I'll walk up to a dog and I'll I'll put my hand up to it like to pet it. And if it starts doing that stuff, I know that it's cannabis. So just FYI, anybody mm -hmm. watching, um, but, um, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a veterinarian, but this is what I've observed. And uh, I don't yeah. know the function behind it, but I think that because you are a chemist and, and that's just how your if mind I, works. Yeah. If there was, if, uh, if it may be that it will just absorb the fat, in, the fat in the milk uh, of the yeah. yogurt. Uh, or it sets up that receptor it. site or something, right? Exactly. Yeah. Or you know, it takes a, it takes in that just like Narcan or something will will fill in that opiate site to to enable the you know the you to come back from that from that uh, opiate right. um, yeah. um, you know uh, influence. Um, so I think absolutely you're onto something. But just FYI, <laughs> we get a lot of people. <laughs> excuse no. me, whose dog ODs on this stuff? So. No. Well, um, doctor, I appreciate your time. I know it's late over there. Um, yep. And I think that Thank we, you. we went into a, a lot of stuff. It's always yeah. a pleasure, man. I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Um, Thank you. And I'll, I'll definitely look for, let you know if I'm back east. or uh, And please let me know if you're ever out here in Seattle. I'd love to take you out to coffee or have lunch with you or something. And, and I would uh, love that. I have family in Seattle, so it may, it may actually happen. 
Oh man, and I love Indian food. <laughs> okay. I love Indian food, except for spicy stuff, dude. Like I, and, and Indian food can get spicy. Oh, <laughs> it, but it's the fantastic sag paneer, naan, uh, so much stuff. You know, I want to go to India someday too. Oh, you know, come check it out. I would love. Let to me go know. To India. Let me know when you make a trip, so I'll I'll give I'll clue you into all the all the best spots. Okay, will do. Right. I love the Indian culture. I love. I studied Hinduism, Jainism. Um, uh, the then you have the the um, the culture there. The fantastic. What is the Euphrates? No, 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 not Euphrates. I'm thinking of a totally different. Um, what's the What's the river there? The um, Ganges. The Ganges, duh. Where they yeah. actually have and. Uh, we'll do cremations yeah, yeah. and allow them back to the flow, right? Yeah. And it's a very holy, holy water. Um, yeah, I love it. I love it. I want to learn more, but I want to. I want to smell the air. I want to, you know, feel the touch of people, and it's just how I like to do things. You know, it's a knowledge yeah. through experience versus just Gnosis. reading about it. Gnosis. Gnosis. All, All right. right. Well, I'm going to say you. goodbye to you in the studio, but we'll say goodbye to everybody else. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye.